A Warhammer Novel, Godric and Felix, Volume 1, Troll Slayer, by William King. This is a dark age, a bloody age, an age of demons and of sorcery. It is an age of battle and death, and of the world's ending. Among all the fire, flame and fury, it is a time too of mighty heroes, of bold deeds and great courage. At the heart of the old world sprawls the Empire, the largest and most powerful of all the human realms. Known for its engineers, sorcerers, traders and soldiers, it is a land of great mountains, mighty rivers, dark forests and vast cities. And from his throne in Altdorf reigns the Emperor Karl Franz, sacred descendant of the founder of these lands, Sigmar, and wielder of his magical warhammer. But these are far from civilized times. Across the length and breadth of the old world, from the nightly palaces of Bretonia to icebound Kislev in the far north, come the rumblings of war. In the towering World's Edge mountains, the orc tribes are gathering for another assault. Bandits and renegades harry the wild southern lands of the border princes. There are rumors of rat things, the skaven emerging from the sewers and swamps across the land. And from the northern wildernesses there is the ever-present threat of chaos, of demons and beastmen corrupted by the foul powers of the dark gods. As the time of battle draws ever near, the Empire needs heroes like never before. Story number one, Geheimnisnacht. After the terrible events and nightmare adventures we endured in Altdorf, my companion and I fled southwards following no path more certain than that chosen for us by blind chance. We took whatever means of transport presented itself, stagecoach, peasant cart, drayage wagon, resorting to our own two feet when all else failed. It was a difficult and fear-filled time for me. At every turn, it seemed, we stood in imminent danger of arrest and either imprisonment or execution. I saw sheriffs in every tavern, and bounty killers behind every bush. If the troll slayer suspected that things might have been otherwise, he never bothered to tell me. To one as ignorant of the true state of our legal system as I was back then, it seemed all too possible that the entire apparatus of our mighty and extensive state might be bent to the apprehension of two fugitives such as ourselves. I did not have then any idea of quite how feebly and randomly the rule of law was applied. It was indeed a pity that all those sheriffs and bounty killers who have peopled my imagination did not in actuality exist, for perhaps then evil would not have flourished quite so strongly within the boundaries of my homeland. The extent and the nature of the evil was to become very clear to me, one dark evening, after boarding a southbound stagecoach, on what is perhaps the most ill-omened night of our entire calendar. From My Travels with Gotrek, Volume 2, by Herr Felix Jaeger, Altdorf Press, 2505. Damn all manling coach drivers and all manling women! Godric Gurnison muttered, adding a curse in Dwarfish. You did have to insult the Lady Zald, didn't you? Felix Jaeger said peevishly. As things are, we're lucky they didn't just shoot us. If you call it lucky to be dumped in the Reichwald on Geheimnisnacht Eve. We paid for our passage. We were just as entitled to sit inside as her. The drivers were unmanly cowards. Godric grumbled. They refused to meet me in hand to hand. I would not have minded being spitted on steel, but being blasted with buckshot is not a death for a troll slayer. Felix shook his head. He could see that one of his companion's black moods was coming on. There would be no arguing with him, and Felix had plenty of other things to worry about. The sun was setting, giving the mist-covered trees a ruddy hue. Long shadows danced eerily and brought to mind many frightening tales of the horrors to be found under the canopies of trees. He wiped his nose with the edge of the cloak, then pulled the Sudanland wool tight about him. 
He sniffed and looked at a sky where Morslib and Manslib, the lesser and greater moons, were already visible. Morslib seemed to be giving a faint greenish glow. That wasn't a good sign. I think I have a fever coming on, Felix said. The troll slayer looked up at him and chuckled contemptuously. In the last rays of the dying sun, his nose chain was a bloody arc running from nostril to earlobe. Yours is a weak race, Gotrek said. The only fever I feel this eve is battle fever. It sings in my head. He turned and glared out into the darkness of the woods. Come out, little beast man, he bellowed. I have a gift for you. He laughed loudly and ran his thumb along the edge of the blade of his great two-handed axe. Felix saw that it drew blood. Gotrek began to suck his thumb. Sigmar preserve us, be quiet, Felix hissed. Who knows what lurks out there on a night like this one? Gotrek glared at him. Felix could see the glint of insane violence appear in his eyes. Instinctively, Felix's hand strayed nearer to the pommel of his sword. Don't give me any orders, Manling. I am of the Elder Race, and I am beholden only to the kings under the mountain, exiled though I may be. Felix bowed formally. He was well schooled in the use of the sword. The scars on his face showed that he had fought several duels in his student days. He had once killed a man, and so ended a promising academic career. But still, he did not relish the thought of fighting the troll slayer. The tip of Gotrek's crested hair came only to the level of Felix's chest, but the dwarf outweighed him, and he was all muscle. And Felix had seen Gotrek use that axe. The dwarf took the bow as an apology, and turned once more to the darkness. Come out, come out, he shouted. I care not if all the powers of evil walk the woods this night. I will face any challenger. The dwarf was working himself up to a pitch of fury. During the time of their acquaintance, Felix had noticed that the troll slayer's long periods of brooding were often followed by brief explosions of rage. It was one of the things about his companion that fascinated Felix. He knew that Gotrek had become a troll slayer to atone for some kind of crime. He was sworn to seek death in unequal combat with fearsome monsters. He seemed bitter to the point of madness. Yet he kept to his oath. Perhaps, thought Felix, I too would go mad if I had been driven into exile among strangers, not even of my own race. He felt some sympathy for the crazed dwarf. Felix knew what it was like to be driven from home under a cloud. The duel with Wolfgang Krasner had caused quite a scandal. At that moment, however, the dwarf seemed bent on getting them both killed and he wanted no part of it. Felix continued to plod along the road, casting an occasional worried glance at the bright full moons. Behind him, the ranting continued. Are there no warriors among you? Come and feel my axe. She thirsts. Only a madman would so tempt fate and the dark powers on Geheimnisnacht, the night of mystery, in the dark reaches of the forest, Felix decided. He could make out a chanting in the flinty, guttural tongue of the mountain dwarves. Then once more in Reichspiel, he heard, Send me a champion! For a second there was silence. Condensation from the clammy mist ran down his brow. Then, from far, far away, the sound of galloping horses rang out in the quiet night. What has the maniac done? Felix thought. Has he offended one of the old powers? Have they sent their demon riders to carry them away? Felix stepped off the road. He shuddered as the wet leaves fondled his face. They felt like dead men's fingers. The thunder of hooves came closer, moving with hellish speed along the forest road. Surely only a supernatural being could keep such breakneck pace on the winding forest road. He felt his hand shake as he unsheathed his sword. I was foolish to follow Gotrek, he thought. Now I'll never get the poem finished. He could hear the loud neighing of horses, the cracking of a whip and mighty wheels turning. Good, Gotrek roared. 
His voice drifted from the trail behind. Good. There was a loud bellowing and four immense jet-black horses drawing an equally black coach hurtled past. Felix saw the wheels bounce as they hit a rut in the road. He heard the sound of feet coming closer. The bushes were pulled aside. Before him stood Gotrek, looking madder and wilder than ever before. His crest was matted, brown mud was smeared over his tattooed body, and his studded leather jerkin was ripped and torn. The snotling fondlers tried to run me over, he yelled. Let's get after them. He turned and headed up the muddy road at a fast trot. Felix noted that Godric was singing happily in Kazalid. Further down the Bogenhaven Road, the pair found the Standing Stones Inn. The windows were shuttered and no lights showed. They could hear a kneeing from the stables, but when they checked there was no coach, black or otherwise, only some skittish ponies and a peddler's cot. We've lost the coach, might as well get a bed for the night, Felix suggested. He looked warily at a smaller moon, more slave. The sickly green glow was getting stronger. I do not like being abroad under this evil light. You are feeble, manling. Cowardly, too. They are gonna have ale inside. On the other hand, some of your suggestions are not without merit. Watery though human beer is, though. Of course, Felix said. Godric failed to spot the note of irony in his voice. The inn was not fortified, but the walls were thick, and when they tried the door, they found it was barred. Godric began to bang it with the butt of his axe shaft. There was no response, though. I can smell humans within, Godric said. Felix wondered how he could smell anything over his own stench. Godric never washed, and his hair was matted with animal fat to keep his red-dyed crest in place. They'll have locked themselves in. Nobody goes abroad on Geheimnisnacht, unless they're witches or demon lovers. That black coach was abroad, Godric said. Its occupants were up to no good. The windows were curtained and the coach bore no crest of arms. My throat is too dry to discuss such details. Come on, open up in there, or I'll take my axe to your door. Felix thought he heard some movement inside. He pressed an ear to the door. He could make out the mutter of voices and what sounded like weeping. Unless you want me to chop through your head, man Lang, I suggest you stand aside, Godric said to Felix. Just a moment. I say, you inside, open up. My friend has a very large axe and a very short temper. I suggest you do as he says or lose your door. What was that about short, Godric said touchily. From behind the door came a thin, quavering cry. In the name of Sigmar, be gone, you demons of the pit. Right, that's it, Godric snapped. I've had enough. He drew the axe back in a huge arc. Felix saw the runes on the blade gleam in the Morslip's light. He leapt aside. In the name of Sigmar, Felix shouted. You cannot exorcise us. We are simple, weary travelers. The axe bit into the door with a chunking sound. Splinters of wood flew from it. Gotrek turned to Felix and grinned evilly up at him. Felix noted the missing teeth. Shoddily made, these manling doors, Gotrek said. I suggest you open up while you still have a door, Felix called. Wait, the quavering voice said. That door cost me five crowns from Jorgen the carpenter. The door was unlatched, and then it opened. A tall, thin man, with a sad face, framed by lank white hair, stood there. He had a stout club in one hand. Behind him stood an old woman, who held a saucer that contained a guttering candle. You will not need your weapon, sir. We require only a bed for the night, Felix said. And ale, the dwarf grunted. And ale, Felix agreed. Lots of ale, Godric said. Felix looked at the old man and shrugged helplessly. Inside, the inn had a low common room. The bar was made of planks stretched across two barrels. 
From the corner, three armed men who looked like traveling peddlers watched them wearily. They had daggers drawn. The shadows hid their faces, but they seemed worried. The innkeeper hustled the pair inside and slid the bars back into place. Can you pay, Herr Doctor? he asked nervously. Felix could see the man's Adam's apple moving. I am not a professor, I am a poet, he said, producing his thin pouch and counting out his few remaining gold coins. But yes, I can pay. Food, Gotrick said, and ale. At this, the old woman burst into tears. Felix only stared. The hag is discomfited, Gotrick said. The old man nodded. Our hunter is missing on this of all nights. Get me some ale, Gotrick said. The innkeeper backed away. Gotrick got up and stumped over to where the peddlers were sitting. They regarded him warily. Do any of you know about a black coach driven by four black horses? Gotrick asked. You have seen the black coach? One of the peddlers asked. The fear was evident in his voice. Seen it? The bloody thing nearly ran me over. A man gasped. Felix heard the sound of a ladle being dropped. He saw the innkeeper stoop to pick it up and begin refilling the tankard. You are lucky then, the fattest and most prosperous looking peddler said. Some say the coach is driven by demons. I have heard it passes here on Geheimnisnacht every year. Some say it carries wee children from Altdorf, who are sacrificed at a Darkstone ring. Gotrek looked at him with interest. Felix did not like the way this was developing. Surely that is only a legend, he said. No, sir, the innkeeper shouted. Every year we hear the thunder of its passing. Two years ago Gunther looked out and saw it, a black coach just as you describe. At the mention of Gunther's name, the old woman began to cry again. The innkeeper brought stew and two great steins of ale. Bring some beer for my companion, too, Gotrek said. The landlord went away for another stein. Who is Gunther? Felix asked when he returned. There was another wail from the old woman. More ale, Gotrek said. The landlord looked in astonishment at the empty flagons. Take mine, Felix said. Now, mine host, who is Gunther? And why does the old hag howl at the very mention of his name? Gotrek asked, wiping his mouth on his mud-encrusted arm. Gunther is our son. He went out to chop wood this afternoon, and he has not returned. Gunther is a good boy, the old woman sniffled. How will we survive without him? Perhaps he is simply lost in the woods. Impossible, the innkeeper said. Gunther knows the woods around here like the back of his hand. He should have come home hours ago. I fear the coven has taken him as a sacrifice. It is just like Lotte Hauptmann's daughter, Ingrid, the fat peddler said. The innkeeper shot him a dirty look. I want no tales told about our son's betrothed, he said. Let the man speak, Gotrek said. The peddler looked at him gratefully. The same thing happened last year in Hartsroch, just down the road. Good wife Houtman looked in on her teenage daughter Ingrid just after sunset. She thought she heard banging coming from her daughter's room. The girl was gone, snatched by who knows what sorceress power from her bed in a locked house. The next day, the hue and cry went up. We found Ingrid. She was covered in bruises in a terrible state. He looked at them to make sure he had their attention. Did you ask her what happened? Felix said. Aye, sir. It seems she was carried off by demons, wild things of the wood, to Darkstone Ring. There the coven waited with evil creatures from the forest. They made to sacrifice her at the altar, but she broke free from the captors and invoked the good name of Blessed Sigmar. While they reeled, she fled. They pursued her, but they could not overtake her. That was lucky, Felix said dryly. There is no need to mock, Herr Doctor. 
We made our way to the stones, and we did find all manner of tracks in the disturbed earth, including those of humans and beasts and cloven-hoofed demons, and a yearling infant gutted like a pig upon the altar. Cloven-hoofed demons? Godric asked. Felix didn't like the look of interest in his eyes. The peddler nodded. I would not venture up to Darkstone Ring tonight, the peddler said. Not for all the gold in Outdorf. It would be a task fit for a hero, Godric said, looking meaningfully at Felix. Felix was shocked. Surely you cannot mean... What better task for a troll slayer than to face these demons on their sacred night? It would be a mighty death. It would be a stupid death, Felix muttered. What was that? Nothing, nothing. You are coming, aren't you? Godric said menacingly. He was rubbing his thumb along the blade of his axe. Felix noticed that it was bleeding again. He nodded slowly. An oath is an oath. The dwarf slapped him upon the back with such force that he thought his ribs would break. Sometimes, manling, I think you may have just a bit of dwarf blood in you. Not that any of the elder race would stoop to such a mixed marriage, of course. He stomped back to his ale. Of course, his companion said, glaring at his back. 